the 1990s. Singapore has become a meticulously managed, spotless, safe and successful city-state. It has developed into one of the world's busiest ports and its airport is among the best in the world. So where do art and culture lie in Singapore's economic equation? They test waters from around the world. They see what's happening everywhere else. It's apparent that any kind of city that is worth its weight actually has a very, very strong focus on the arts and, and, and culture. Uh, museums, theatres, cinemas. These are things that actually have a, a definite impact on visitors, whether you're from overseas or from, and also from, from their own countries. So obviously this is something they use as a good example. The government begins to highlight the value of arts and culture as a fabric that will hold its people together. It will also potentially bring in numbers for tourism. Singapore is envisioned as a renaissance city, where the world's talents and ideas can converge and multiply. To achieve that, buildings to accommodate world-class performances and exhibitions were built or refurbished. It was 2001, I think, when Esplanade was open. A lot of people were making a big fuss about how that's not going to support local art and it's all about the big spectacle and, uh, you know, local artists are never going to be able to fill up those seats. But now we can, you know, a lot of local programming is happening as well. So it takes time. These things take time. I think uh, we must be patient. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, with this kind of support we're getting from the government, that it will be ongoing and it won't be retracted too quickly, just when you're about to find some kind of fruition. Uh, so hopefully there's an understanding that there's some period of incubation with any kind of uh, evolution in, in the art scene or cultural scene. While the infrastructure to display arts events was being created, there was also an undercurrent of independent arts activities dealing with artists' own bodies and the notion of disembodiment. Castration, milk, umbilical cord, fallopian tube, orgasm, clitoris, menopause. So what were these artists trying to communicate with their bodies and what was it about it that was so powerful and dangerous to cause such a reaction from the state? Well, today, thanks to technology, I get to speak to Suzanne Victor, who is currently based in Australia and I hope she can shed some light on her work, as well as what was happening in the 90s. So his mother as a theatre is a reply to the Singapore state at the time um, about, you know, this whole process of um, disembodiment, you know, as I would think it is. There's always this tension of embodiment and disembodiment in the way that we use our agency, whether it's in the cultural field or, you know, in our own personal lives. This work addresses and makes a response and engages um, with the whole, um, the way we, you know, we prospect the body as, as a form of cultural currency in Singapore at the time. So that was what brought the work about. It operates on many levels. So how are we going to respond to this body that's so explicit? Because all the words are very explicit um, and it describes and it asserts um, the inner nudity of the body into a public space. His Mother's a Theatre is premised upon the fact that the body how the body as object, how we use the body, the body as subject, which is part of our whole subjectivity as individuals, you know, as belonging to a particular society um, with a particular political process and what happens to that body. 
So I think from this event, it led to an absence of a kind of body in Singapore, which is the performance in visual arts in Singapore. What's exciting about contemporary art is its plurality, the multitude of voices and range of materials and media that are used. The kaleidoscope of contemporary art sparks a myriad of emotions and possibilities in the arts, both for the artists and the audience. My question is, how does one begin to appreciate and deal with these forms of expression? With what we call today contemporary art, to me the exciting thing is that it can encompass anything. So it's also not just about, um, I like to say that it's not anymore about the brush or the chisel, it's, it's a kind of uh, mental instrumentation. So how, how you approach something has a lot to do with the kind of art you make. Art can take any form at all, and a lot has to do with the content of what the artist wants to say, for instance, or what they're reflecting on. So uh, I think what we're trying to encourage people to understand is that don't expect that art will look in a way that you might recognise it as art. It could be something that you don't even know. You walk right past it, you don't know it's there. I think what is important is for us to recognise there is a certain agency that comes with uh, each visitor. They have their own education, discipline, experiences, even predicaments. And these, in totality, will shape the kind of engagement and experience they have in the gallery. What a curator, what an exhibition perhaps must think about is how to make meaningful that encounter, as such that the encounter produces many different things. Perhaps allowing for a very individualized way in which each visitor can engage and therefore form certain perspectives as they go out of the exhibition. So in a sense, uh, as, many as, as many visitors as we have, we should have that many perspectives when they leave. Art doesn't just reflect life. Artists may be influenced by the kind of social political systems they live in, but sometimes art is just an independent process of emotions and thoughts. As Singapore continues to move forward and change, contemporary artists engage with different mediums to create new interpretations and notions of our past. Singapore's landscape is ever-changing. Our histories are forgotten too soon, erased beneath our feet. I struggle to find fragments of the past to hold on to. How have artists dealt with memory, inherited histories and myths? Utama Sangnila Utama Founder of Tamasic Creator of Singapura, the Lion City. Man, myth or legend? What does Ho Zun Yen's version of Utama tell us about ourselves today? People or artists may actively think about history as ways in which they uh, invest certain thoughts and ideas in relation to uh, contemporary situations. So, for example, Ho Zun Yen's piece about Utama has been thought of as an artist's interest towards a history before Raffles. And I think that comes to a kind of a broad strain of thinking amongst artists as well as public in general about what constitutes history, what constitutes and what limits the idea of our history. Is history something that has to be cast in uh, tight formal terms or has to be cast in ways that no form of imaginaries can penetrate. And I think this is what Zunian is doing by insisting that imaginaries, imaginings can actually have a certain uh, role uh, in terms of uh, socialising history uh, as part of the public discussion today. Tell me about Utama. Uh, every name in history is I. Uh, tell me about the inspiration behind it. I would say that rather than starting with an inspiration, Utama is a project that started out as a question. Mm. I was basically uh, interested in this founder of Singapore, 
who's uh, whom we call Sangnila Utama, mm. because uh, I find that if you speak to most Singaporeans about when Singapore is founded and by whom, most of the time the answer will be Raffles. Raffles yes. in 1819. But does it mean that there was nothing? There was no history in Singapore before 1819. Apparently not, lah. Yeah. <laughs> According to the, the the general, you know, sort of understanding of Singapore, yeah. we seldom ever hear about Sangnila Utama, like uh, who is he, where is he from, and what was he doing in this part of the world. After all, he is the person that uh, supposedly gave us our name, mm. Sing Singapura, meaning right. Lion City in yes. Sanskrit. I was curious to find out. More about him, but in a way, I think this project also opens up the question of why is it that Singaporeans are only focused on Raffles? Mm. Like, uh, why do we like our history to begin with Raffles? And uh, in a way, it leads to a bigger question as to history itself. Like, yeah. who determines who what is history? Yeah, and that leads to a bigger question, which is. Uh, Whose interest does this version of history serve? Yeah. You know, so these are the questions that drive the project. The name Sangnila Utama itself is a name that can refer to a number of possible individuals. So there's also this multiplicity of possible readings into what it actually means that he saw a lion in Singapore. When, as we all know, there are no lions, no, no lions yeah. ever walk. These lands, lions are not uh, creatures that are indigenous to this part of the world. Yes. The interesting interpretation is that it is not so much that he saw a lion, but that the lion is actually an allegory mm. for the lion throne, which signifies a great kind of power in mm. the old Hindu kind of uh, religious uh, structure. Mm. So, uh, for a lot of people, Sushi Buana came from, uh, it was a Sumatran prince, or maybe he was a traitor. Mm. And he betrayed like his uh, overlords, mm -hmm. and he escaped to Singapore, mm. and he tried to found his own uh, empire, and that's why he he ascended sort of a, a lion throne. So the sighting of the lion is 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 actually just you know a kind allegorical of uh, an for... allegorical uh, way of uh, describing this real historical event. Right. Like, so this was supposed to be his new seat of power. Exactly. Kind of so it's almost like reimagining history yeah, in a way. That. Yeah, I think an interesting artwork that engages with history will definitely have to perform the task of reconstructing or reimagining history. Mm. So, in a sense, I almost think uh, art is that which is uh, opposed to history, you know, because uh, history is uh, accounts written from the perspectives of those who win, mm. and uh, we can even say that histories are always backed up by armies. Mm. You know, always backed up by power and authority. Um, whereas art is neither on is not on the side of those who win, neither is it on the side of those who lose. So art is not on any side. All it does is it imagines uh, other possibilities and other virtual alternate realities. Where do you see all these fit in Singapore today, uh, in terms of your? Practice your art and the history where it is now. Talk about that. Sure. Uh, I think uh, in Singapore, things change very quickly. So I mean, just from the perspective of someone, um, you know, working in the arts, uh, I think the landscape for for contemporary art has changed very uh, drastically in the last uh, maybe six to eight years. And uh, I think it's also very important that one is not just uh, reacting to these changes, but one finds uh, ways to engage with it productively, and productively in the sense of how it might push or intensify your your practice. Uh, so it's important to use what is available in the landscape in, in order just to um, kind of push your own art practice further. I mean that's that's the ideal of uh, how how I think we can kind of like navigate the landscape, but uh, it's it's not as easy as I you know mm. making it sound. The location of Singapore as a historical seaport has inspired myths around the island. The sea is a significant image, connecting Singapore to the rest of the world. Former national sailor Charles Lim uses this as his source of inspiration and connects the modern city back to its past, once a sleepy fishing village.
Charles Lim's Sea State series features photographic and video works as well as audio materials drawn from the artist's ongoing exploration of Singapore's maritime geography and history. He examines how Singapore's relationship with the sea has evolved over the years. Land reclamation and the reshaping of Singapore's physical boundaries have moved people further away from the sea and with it, our lives along the coast. A lot of your work has a connection to the sea. You were also a sailor. Yeah. When I started off like being an artist, you know, actually I was kind of resisting against it. I didn't want to like do anything about my personal history of the sea. Actually, I felt it was too, too, uh, too autobiographical. I, you know, I, I tend not to want to work like that actually. So uh, there was a, so I guess, you know, I kind of avoided it actually. So, but at this point in time, now I'm, I'm beginning to work on it also. If you see the work that I'm doing, I don't really pull my own personal history into the sea. By me working on the sea, it's almost like saying something from an insider's point of view, I guess. Mm. Singapore being the busiest port and, and how it's so uh, important to our economy and driving our economy. Yet, but yet, we have actually very, very little connection with the actual material, yeah. the actual sea. And as you say, the cultural identity and its cultural uh, influence on us as Singaporeans. So can you talk about that as well? In a strange way, when, yeah, when, when, when you're in Singapore, you don't feel that you're on an island, actually. It feels like uh, your, the sea doesn't feel very close at all, actually. And I really knew, actually, before I started this project, that, that at some point in time, Singaporeans became disconnected from the water, actually. Because when you look through the archive footage of Singapore, um, around the 60s, 50s, actually, Singapore is very vibrant around water, and people are living in the islands, uh, people are living along the coast, and at some point, some point in time, uh, all of that disappeared actually. And I, I was trying to locate when did this happen. I feel that the sea is not, uh, it's, it's a very contested space now. In, uh, it's no longer a public space, it's, it's actually a very corporatized, very militarized zone now actually, in a sense. I think the best of our Singapore contemporary artists are definitely more historically sensitive. Singapore tends to be an object of inquiry. Someone like Charles Lim in his Sea State projects, he's trying to uncover another story, kind of like submerged story of the seas around Singapore and Singapore being an island. And I think artists are now also quite textually sensitive or textually driven. They're interested in taking apart received narratives or received histories. And they're all starting to question, was you know, Singapore a sleepy kind of fishing village before Stanford Raffles came? And Singapore is completely vibrant and has, a, uh, if you believe John Mixick's research, that it has had a vibrant kind of trading port cultural hub status for, you know, a, a few hundred years you know, before the arrival of the British. So in fact, they are also trying to undermine a kind of uh, colonial narrative of Singapore that's somehow kind of self-perpetuated by our own system. Singapore has journeyed through an interesting collection of contemporary works over the past few decades. Some works were performed as a form of protest, some as a personal journey, while others documented our past. So where will we go from here? What will Singapore's future landscape for the arts look like? I think art of its times responds to its times. Art of its place responds to its place. Every country, every nation, every city has its own sort of setup in a way that does influence the artist as much as, I think, art and culture also influence how the city looks. I'm hoping for the time when we can think about value in a way which is about the intangible. What is valuable is the human experience and to what extent you can deepen that experience so that we really come in touch with, go beyond culture, go beyond nation, go beyond Singaporeanness and get to the heart of what it means to be human and that it can be a Singaporean artist who gets us there. That's what I hope for. In my ideal uh, art scene situation, I would wish for an art scene that is much less under the spectre of official censorship or control, and also better platforms for dialogue between artists, institutions and officials. And I think the only way to kind of grow the scene would be a kind of levelling 
of this supposed hierarchy where artists, institutions and officials are seen as equals in the same community. My wish is also that the, the art scene is less bracketed by these individual communities that sometimes look like they don't even speak to each other. What I'm concerned about is what kind of resources are there, both in terms of material resources to build on these premises? That is to say, where is this art going to be collected from? And who are going to provide the voices for this story? This story of the modern in the art in Singapore and Southeast Asia, as well as in the world. In my view, the curators are very keen, industrious, hardworking. They're all very young and new to the game. So they are going to take a long time in developing their own expertise, their own maturity, in order to tell a story that ostensibly is 100 years and more. Who can convincingly tell a story that is 100 years old? And how is that voice to be trained and projected to tell that story persuasively and vividly? That is the task for the museum. And it is not going to be instantly achieved. It's going to take time. All stories take time to be written and to be told. I've come to the end of my journey and traversed through 50 years of Singapore's history through art. From independence to present day, art was sometimes created in response to Singapore's physical and social transformation. It encapsulates the stories of our pioneers, but sometimes purely from life, where living and art run parallel to each other and no connections can be made. As art is forever changing, the trail that it leaves behind is mesmerizing to look at, to feel and to connect to. And as the city becomes more cosmopolitan and new narratives emerge, what stories will unfold?